Hello, everyone. All right, go into uh, Blackboard and under today's files, you should see a file with the Cartesian Oval in case you didn't already download a few weeks ago or if you downloaded it, but then made a bunch of changes. And you should also see a Mathematica file about animating waves. We're gonna use both of those today. So go ahead and download those while we wait for a few more people to show up. How did the mechanics uh, midterm yesterday go? It wasn't bad at all. He gave us a lot of extra time actually because he messed up on the time limit. Okay. Have you guys gotten into Lagrangians yet? No, not yet. And I think your audio is looping. It shouldn't be now. I just uh, edited it. Just change the setting. <sighs> the Grangians are arguably the most beautiful thing in physics. I don't know if he'll do, uh, I don't know how, I know, I don't know if he'll do what I would pronounce as Nether's theorem, but being in the same department as Dr. Morell is, I always feel bad about my pronunciation of German names. It's uh, spelled like that. But if you see Nether's theorem and you aren't overcome with beauty and awe, some people like to say that means that you should be an experimental theorist, an experimental physicist instead of a theoretical physicist. Um, I think it was Landau who said that if you aren't filled with joy upon seeing Lagrangians, then you shouldn't be a theorist, you should be an experimentalist because Lagrangians are one of those elegant things that if you're a theorist, you love them. And I'm not trying to put down experimentalists. Frankly, if you don't find deep satisfaction from troubleshooting something with your hands and getting it to work right, you shouldn't be an experimentalist because that's a big part of what they do. But Emmy Nether's theorem was one of the most is one of the most beautiful things in all of physics. And I don't know if he'll get to her theorem. He'll at least get to something that's a consequence of it, but I don't know if he'll actually call it Nether's theorem. But it relates to symmetries and conservation laws in Lagrangian mechanics. Yeah, there are analogs for, I mean, conservation laws and quantum mechanics are also related to symmetries of the Hamiltonian. If something's a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, then there will be an associated eigenvalue, and there will be, uh, in some cases, symmetry degenerate eigenstates. But they usually don't say the word Nether's theorem in undergrad quantum mechanics, or even sometimes the, the standard grad quantum mechanics, they say it in field theory. Um, the undergrad phys mechanics textbooks don't usually use the word Nether's theorem, but I use it because it's a pretty easy extension once you know um, Lagrangian mechanics. Okay, let's see here. We have 14 students. So let's get started. You should have downloaded um, some files. Before we do the Cartesian Oval file, I'm going to go over, even though I delayed um, the, the ZMAX assignment until Thursday, the next one I'm not going to delay. Um, I don't know why we lost that analysis. Okay, so there's for the next Z, for next week's Zmax assignment, which I could extend until Thursday, but I'm kind of reluctant to do that because there's also a problem set due Thursday. Um, we'll see. But this file is messy, and I don't want you to mess around with any of the lens data here. This was basically my best attempt at emulating the lens design for a triplet zoom in the book. One of the simpler triplet, triplet zoom designs in the assigned reading. And I broke this up into three groups of lenses. And you're wondering what these extra lines are. These extra lines here, 
are just the boundaries of some imaginary layers in air. They're the boundaries between one air layer and another. No, that doesn't mean that we literally put a piece of glass there. It just means to separate the air or whatever. It just means that I asked ZMAX to break up the air into two layers. So this first layer, well, this, it's the first in there, but this first one that we're gonna think about, vary between zero and 2.5. If you change this one, then one, two, three other layers, the ones labeled P for pickup change. You'll notice that they're right now 0, 2.5, uh, 0, and 2.5. Well, if I change this to 2.5, suddenly the next pickup becomes 0, and the one after that becomes 2.5, and the one after that becomes 0. And what's happening is we're moving this pair of lenses here, back and forth, by playing with some layer thicknesses. We change this, actually we're not moving these, we're moving everything relative to these. We change the size of this layer because we shift these two lenses to the right and these two lenses to the right. And if we changed it to something in the middle, I don't know, 0.5, then this one becomes, two, this one becomes 0.5, and this one becomes two. So basically this one and this one are equal. And this one is 2.5 minus that control layer. And this one is also 2.5 minus the control layer. And so all you're doing is varying how far we move that control layer. And as you move that control layer, you can look at a spot diagram. And we can see this is actually not very well focused. If you look at it, it doesn't look like what you usually see when you get something focused, which is that you have a bunch of tightly clustered rays in the middle, and then the outer rays get further out. And those distances grow very rapidly. Here, the distances are growing, but they're not growing as rapidly as we're used to seeing. And the distances grow rapidly because of aberrations, because any ray that's hitting the lens away from the center is going to, instead of going right to the center of the image plane, it's gonna get sent further out by an amount that's proportional to the cube of how far off axis it is. You proved that a few ZMAX assignments ago. Well, if I play with it, we can see what happens to the spot size. Let's make that layer zero. So we're moving some things all the way to the left. Gets a little bit better focused. You can make it somewhere in the middle. That one's actually pretty well focused too. You can see that at some places, this is actually pretty focused. It might not be obvious, but it is pretty well focused, all right? In that you've got some tight clustering of the center rays, and then the other thing starts spreading out rapidly. Then we go further out. Ooh, that's not so well focused. And then we go there, and that's a little bit well focused again. You see how as we move the pair of lens groups, as we move these first two and these last two left and right, it goes in and out of focus. That's one of the ideas I talked about last week. Last week I said, um, I'm gonna share a whiteboard so I don't have to keep, I'll share my other device. Share my other device so that we have it saved. I said last week that if we have zoom lenses, we've got a trio, which for simplicity, I'll draw all positive. These two move together, you can move them a distance X. 
Then we were to just say, all right, here's the initial image position, or here's the an image position for one particular configuration. But in fact, the proper image position might be somewhere else. It's gonna be some delta S, and delta S depends on how far left and right you're moving this pair of lenses. And I said that if we do this right, we can often get something that kind of wiggles in and out like that a few times, focused, out of focus, back into focus, out of focus, focused again. Does that look familiar? That was sort of the idea of zoom lenses, that the image plane, strictly speaking, is not always in the same, or let me phrase that, that's the idea of optically compensated zoom lenses, that the image plane is not always in the same spot. Well, I want you to verify that behavior for this system. I mean, I showed you something that looks like it qualitatively. I tried several different X values and we didn't actually do a quick focus to see where it would be focused, but we clearly saw that it's kind of going in and out of focus. I want you to do the quick focuses and you know, try several different positions. Try maybe a dozen positions between zero and 2.5 and see how far does the image plane shift each time? And then also see what is the focal length as a function of X. So if this is Delta S, then I also want you to find the focal length. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Which is it? I want you to basically think of this as an exercise in taking a lens system that someone else designed for you. It might be great, it might be terrible, but either way, you have to play around with the specs to see if you can infer some of its properties. Any questions on that? Anyone? Okay. Then we're going to switch gears. Now I want you to go to the ZMAX file I posted for today instead of the one that I posted with next week's assignment. And I'm gonna close that file, save the changes. And this is an old file for Cartesian Oval. Don't change anything in the lens data. Just go to a layout and go to a spot diagram. Does anybody need time for that? All right. This is, at least for that one on axis point, about as perfect as a lens can get. Yeah, the rays don't quite come to a point. That's because you know we only had, we specified the uh, the parameters of this lens to only so many decimal places, so it's not perfect for perfect, but it's about as close to perfect, at least for that on-axis point, as a lens could get. Well, if lenses really could take a point object and produce a true point image, then a whole lot of science would be easy because we could form images of things on the molecular scale. That would be great. So much of science would be easy. Chemistry would be easy. Biology would, biology would still be hard if you have, because life is messy. But looking at biology would be easy, okay? At least one part of biology would be very, very easy. Sadly, that is not the case. I mean, all we'd have to do is grind some lenses to really, really, really good aspherical shapes. But biology is not that easy. So let's go to the analysis window. And let's go to something called the PSF. And let's select the Huygens PSF. All right. PSF stands for point spread function. And you probably get a choppy mountain shaped thing that looks like that. And if you increase 
the sampling. That's basically telling it how many fine points to segment it into. You should notice that there's a peak. And then there are these little ripples out there. And if we looked at a cross section of that, we go to Huygens PSF cross section. The difference between Huygens and FFT PSF, Huygens is the more exact way of doing the calculation. FFT stands for fast Fourier transform, which means that it's fast. It's not quite as precise for certain purposes, but it's very good. Um, we'll use that when we have to. We'll use um, Huygens whenever we can, whenever it's not too difficult of a calculation. If we look at a cross section, again, we go to, let's do, let's break the pupil up into more spots. And let's break the image up into more spots you should notice that indeed there are these little ripples here. Anybody not getting these kinds of results? Anybody need me to take a question on ZMAX and its menus? What's happening in these calculations is that ZMAX is taking into account the fact that light is not a ray. It's taking into account the fact that light is actually a wave and waves spread out. And in this class, we're not going to go into as much depth with wave optics as Dr. Salik's class goes. So if you've taken that class or you're taking it right now, the next few weeks will be kind of easy. Enjoy an easy ride. If you haven't taken that, we're gonna at least go into enough depth to understand a basic calculation of this shape. Because this shape, the fact that the light does not get focused to a single point, but in fact gets focused to this blur with little ripples, fundamentally limits how well you can um, image something. Because you try to make an image of a point object and you'd love to just get a little bright point here and then if there was something next to it, you could get, you know, it was just a tiny bit over, you get a little bright point here. And these two bright points wouldn't be overlapping each other. So as long as you had a really fine detector, which might be quite difficult to make, but at least in principle, you could do something to say, there's a bright point right here and there's a bright point right there. And I can tell them apart. And if I can tell them apart, if I have fine enough detectors then I can see the tiniest thing in the world, but we can't, we're limited by that, that we're limited by the wavelength of light. And we will eventually talk about how, in fact, there are ways to get around the wavelength of light. Over the years, a substantial portion of my research efforts have often focused on that. So in some sense, everything I'm telling you here is incomplete, there are ways around it. But in order to get around those things, we first had to understand very deeply what the actual problem is here. And all of the people who design things for what they call super resolution, seeing smaller than the wavelength of light, all of the people who understand super resolution deeply understand the wave optics problem. There's an, we're not teaching you something that's wrong or something that you don't need. In fact, we're teaching you the entire basis of the ways that people get around the diffraction limit. So let's, let's see what happens if we change some parameters of this system. We could play with the wavelength, we could play with the aperture. Let's, uh, let's double the width of the aperture and just see what happens. Oh, that's interesting. It might not look like it on the screen, but in fact, it got a little bit narrower. I think, um, let's go back to, let's go to one. When in doubt, you go to a smaller aperture. So yeah, so right now, when we're at an aperture of one, this node, this dip is around minus 5.5. And there's another dip at about, plus 5.5. Well, if we double the aperture, 
Oh, that dip just shifted. The dip shifted to about half of 5.5 something. Let's, uh, let's go to half the original aperture instead of, instead of being around 5.5 something, now it's around 11 point something. And we can get more precision if we did finer sampling. Yeah. Yeah, we're not getting that much better precision. But it's around 11 point something instead of 5.5 something. So one thing we can say is that the width of this spot that we focus the light down to is inversely proportional to the aperture. If we make our aperture wide, we focus to a small spot. If we make our aperture narrow, we focus it to a wide spot. Does that seem weird in light of some other things we've done this semester? Is there anything aberrant about this? So as you increase the aperture diameter, um, the aperture gets worse or spherical aperture gets worse. Spherical aberration gets oh, worse. Oh, aberration. If a lens has spherical aberration, then you're right. If it has spherical aberration, the spherical aberration gets worse. So you found in some previous assignments that if we made the aperture wider, we would just get a bloody god awful mess. We just get the image would just get wide, or not the image, the spot that the light was focused to would just get wider and wider. But here we're seeing the exact opposite. Is there any contradiction between what we're saying, what we're seeing here, and that fact that if you have spherical aberration, you um, you um, get a worse image or a worse spot as you widen the aperture? This calculation, first of all, do you see any evidence of spherical aberration in here? No. No, there's no evidence of spherical aberration here. This calculation is based on the assumption that light is a ray, that this ray travels in straight lines. And when it travels in straight lines, it only changes direction when it hits this surface. And again, a little bit when it hits this surface. And other than that, we assume no spreading of light. We don't assume any wave behavior. Well, if we don't assume spreading, then we should, if we design the lens right with the right Cartesian oval shape, we really should get all the rays coming to a point. And if they don't quite come to a point, it's because we didn't specify the Cartesian oval with um, perfect precision. This calculation here, which shows that how the ripples of light spread out, in this calculation here, takes into account more physics. You could think of this as zooming in on reality, zooming in on nature, taking into account the wave nature of light, whereas you could think of these calculations and these calculations as zooming out. And so there is no spherical aberration. Spherical aberration, there's no spherical aberration. The shape is just right to focus rays. That lens really is perfect for rays. If you can get to a universe where information is carried by rays instead of waves, this is the lens that you want. This lens really is within the assumptions of those calculations, perfect for that point. There's absolutely nothing that is inconsistent in these calculations. This calculation is completely consistent 
with its assumptions and within the domain of its assumptions, it's absolutely correct. This calculation brings in additional assumptions, takes into account physics that wasn't in the first calculation. And so we see that when there is no spherical aberration, we get light that is spreading out and how much it spreads out is inversely proportional to the aperture. Well, let's, let's play with the wavelength. Uh, instead of doing 0.55 microns, let's do half of that. Oh, this glass has not been rated for 0.275. Then let's see if this glass is rated for infrared. Let's go to 1.1. And it's way more spread out. It probably has aberrations. Um, well, you see that it's still, you see that it still has that ripple behavior. It's just that everything got wider. So what we do is we normalize it. Normalize it just means that we make, there's two ways to normalize data. You either make the peak one or you make the area under the curve one. The problem is that because this has a different refractive index for infrared, it's no longer um, it's no longer free of aberrations. So let's just oh, it actually works pretty well. The focal length change; it still has chromatic aberration. But yeah, that actually worked better than I had hoped. So we go to infrared and lo and behold, we get this pattern, right? We get the same pattern again, except that it's wider. So we increase the wavelength and we get a wider profile. We decrease the wavelength. And as long as we focus properly, Yeah, it's taking forever to do that calculation. We see that the, uh, the pattern gets narrower. And if we make smaller changes in wavelength, so let's just go out to the borderline of the infrared. So we're gonna widen it by about 30%. And again, it's out of focus because this glass has chromatic aberration. But we refocus it. And we see that it does indeed get a little bit wider. So what we have is that the spot size is proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the aperture width. Any questions on that so far? Well, I'm going to close that because, uh, and I'm not going to save the changes because I don't want to mess with a good thing. That was a good file before I was playing with it. Let's just go into any old file that has a simple thin lens, single thin lens diffraction limit. Okay, I was playing around with that one for the diffraction limit a couple of years ago. So you just go into any file you have that is um, set up with a single thin lens. Or just create one out of BK7. 
You know what? I'm just going to upload this one. What on earth? I have no idea what is going on there. Um, yeah, let's let's make that smaller. Um, I have no idea what just happened. That that is weird to me. So we made that infinity. Okay. Let's look at that. All right. You know what? So that we're all looking at the same thing. I'm gonna upload this right now. All right, so go ahead and download that one so that we're all looking at the same thing. And then if you only have the ZMX file and not the ZDA, you're probably just gonna get the lens data, but then you can go to the layout and then spot diagram. Where is it uploaded again? It should be on Blackboard with the lecture file. Yeah, lecture slides, lecture notes, files used during class. It should be. Oh, you know what? I uploaded it on the. I clicked on the ninth instead of the sixteenth by accident. Single thin lens diffraction limit. Yeah, I clicked on the ninth instead of the sixteenth. My bad. Okay, yeah, I see it. I'll, I'll also add it to the 16th, just so that people who aren't here at the moment have it later. Wait another minute. Anybody still need time? Okay, hearing no response. Should have a layout like this. Your spot diagram should show something that looks perfect. You may be thinking, wait, is this a Cartesian oval? No, it's not Cartesian oval, but we have a very narrow aperture. And let's just first verify that this really is not a Cartesian oval by widening the aperture. And okay, it starts to get wider. Let's go up. Oops. Yeah, there, that's getting pretty wide. So this lens definitely has aberrations, but we don't notice any of those aberrations when the aperture is really tiny. And if we look at 
a cross section. I don't know what's going on here. So I'm just going to close the diffraction and circle of energy. I don't know why that thing is taking forever to run. I think that in some earlier iteration of the file, the message says, we'll just close it. We're gonna start everything from the beginning. Let's just open a Huygens PSF. All right, we see that it's looking like we had before. We can see the ripples. And then if we increase the aperture, okay, just a tiny tweak to it. If we go up to four, huh, you see how it kind of flattened out? It flattened out because now the light is really spread out. We saw that in the spot diagram. You might say, well, maybe we could improve on that by doing a quick focus. We know that as we widen it and we get worse aberrations, we need to do a quick focus. That, uh, that kind of helps, except that these side ripples are still pretty big relative to the center. The fact that the side ripples are now pretty big relative to the center kind of tells us that light is spreading out more. And light spreading out more is the whole definition of an aberration. And so we're seeing that aberration phenomena do show up in the wave calculations. And let's go back into the analysis. Let's go back to PSF and let's do a cross section. And let's, uh, let's normalize it. And let's sample it a little bit wider. Okay, so let's let's bring this all the way back down to 0 0.5. And as we have, or even 0 0.25. Okay, we're at 0 0.25 and we're way outside the aberration regime. So we'll do a quick focus just to see if the focus shifted. All right, so we've got it like this. We've got a very narrow aperture. When we look at our layout, we can see just how narrow the beam entering the lens is. When we look at the spot diagram, we can see, see that nothing is spreading out. And when we look at our cross section, we have this nice ripple behavior. And then we double the width. And right now there's a dip right around, ooh, if we zoom in on that, 17, 18, 18-ish. Let's dip around 17 or 18. So the dip went from 34-ish to 17-ish. We doubled the aperture and we got half the beam width. That's interesting. That's the thing we saw before with the Cartesian oval. Now we double it again and we get about half the beam width still. We, we get half the width. Okay, we get half again, half again. Every time we double, we get half. You notice how it doesn't go quite down to zero there? That means that either aber the aberrations must matter. When aberrations matter, the focus shifts a little bit. So, okay, we, we do a quick focus just to get that in focus. Still double the aperture, roughly half the, uh, spot size, that's good. 
oh, didn't get cut in half. I mean, it looks like it might've gone a little bit narrow, except it's definitely not going to zero now. We do a quick focus, improves it a little. Okay, well, that's interesting. One of the dips is actually at less than half, but you see how the side lobe just got wider? This is getting weird. Side lobe just got higher. And we go up to eight. And again, the first dip comes in more. All right, well, that's kind of what we've been expecting, except that the light is getting spread out even more. You see how these side lobes are higher relative to what they were, and they're not tapering off as rapidly. That's light spreading out. When we look not at the cross section, but at this, we normalize it. There's a whole lot of ripples here. So it seems like once we get to the aberration regime, some of the features continue to get narrower, but the light itself starts getting spread out more again. Any questions? For practical purposes, if you're trying to focus light, the whole idea is you're trying to figure out what area the light is confined to. Knowing that there's a little ring here doesn't do you a whole lot of good. And you might say, well, you know, I mean, this peak here is still much lower than the center peak. But this ring has a bigger circumference covers actually a bigger area than the center peak. So because it covers a bigger area, smaller peak, larger time, larger area, the integral is gonna be comparable. And what do we really wanna know? We wanna know how much area is the light confined to? Any questions on the tools I've shown you so far before I show you one more tool? You've been playing around with these ZMAX tools for analyzing the focused light for a few minutes. Any questions on them so far? All right, well, here's the one I like the most. It's called the diffraction sampling 16. 1384 by 16,384 crashed ZMAX. That doesn't surprise me. You sample enough and you will crash. Something called a diffraction enclosed energy graph. And it gets really hard to do these calculations when you're in the aberration regime, because when you have aberrations, the light is spread out over more area. And so all these wave optics calculations require adding up energy in a much wider range of points, adding up many more waves. Okay, here's what an encircled energy graph is. An encircled energy graph basically looks at this thing and says, hey, what if I were to just draw a little circle around the center? Can I get a purely top down? Okay, if I were to just draw a little circle of this radius, what percentage of my energy would I get? Then I draw a circle of this radius. What percentage of my energy do I get? Then I draw a circle of this radius. What percentage do I get? Then a circle of this radius. What percent of the energy is enclosed? And you keep drawing larger circles and asking what percentage of the energy falls inside that circle. You could think of it as, hey, if I put a detector of this size, a little circle that absorbs light and converts it into an electrical signal, I put a little detector of this size in there, then 
what percentage of the beam's energy will that detector pick up? And of course, if you made it really large, then you're gonna get like 99% of the beam's energy. Questions on that concept? All right, well, what we're seeing, ignore the black line for a minute. The blue and the green are the on axis zero degrees and off axis three degrees. It's saying what percentage of the energy is enclosed if we just go this far out from the center looking at either the on axis or off axis. And I could have it because I'm sampling at 1024, if I cut the aperture in half, right now the 50% mark is around 22 microns. I have to go out 22 microns to capture half the light. And the, read the point where you cap, the distance where you capture half the light is often considered a good benchmark of size for practical purposes. Okay, and that looks terrible, but keep in mind, that's not focused, right? Every time we're in the aberration regime, every time we change the aperture, we get a different focus. So it looks like everything shifted out even worse. And you're thinking, okay, we narrowed the aperture and things got worse. We're not in the aberration regime, but you know we're not focused. Let's do a quick focus. And then it's going to, take a long time to calculate. And then because things are about to get better, I'm gonna reduce the sampling after this. Oh, wow. Okay. So we cut the aperture in half and we went from getting 50% of the, okay, you know, before we do anything else, let me just go to a lower sampling so our calculations are easier. Instead of getting 50% of the energy when you go out like 22 microns, we get 50% of the energy when you go out, oh, three point something microns. Now let's think here. Aber spherical aberration, spot size is proportional to aperture to the what power? Is it aperture to the first, to the second, to the third, to the pi? Aperture to the what power? What power? Adin, dva, tri, chateri, piat, shest, sem, vosem, what? No, not two pi. Uno, dos, tres, quattro, three. Spasibo, three. It's the third power. So if I cut the aperture in half, then aperture cubed gets divided by eight. And here, this rough estimate of the spot size got divided by not quite eight, but something very close to it. That's a sign that we are dealing with aberrations, okay? And then let's cut it in half again. And again, it, it looks somewhat better, but not that much better. We're in the aberration regime. We do a quick focus here. Okay. And now what we see is that the blue curve and the black curve almost exactly match up. The black curve is called diff limit, diffraction limit. The black curve is what pattern the light would have if you focused it and your lens didn't have any aberrations. It's a highly, highly idealized case. 
And it's a very important idealized case because you really can't do any better than that if all you're doing is focusing light to it with a lens. There are ways to pull information out, even though you can't focus light to a spot smaller than, any, than that. But you really can't see, you really can't focus light to a spot smaller than that. There are a few technicalities involving metamaterials and plasmons and um, certain things with weird phase masks. But regular lenses aren't taking advantage of any of those technicalities. And all of those things have drawbacks. The drawback to metamaterials is that they're incredibly noise sensitive. The drawback to plasmons is you need very special focusing geometries in very close proximity to your object. So it's, it's not a non-invasive imaging technique. The uh, drawback to using the weird phase mask is that you actually lose a ton of light a whole bunch of signal gets shunted off elsewhere, but the signal that's in the middle is focused to a really tiny spot. It's just that you lose so much signal that it's not worth it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. All I'm saying is that the exceptions to the things that I'm telling you about have huge technical complications. So anything that you do with ordinary glass and lenses, you really can't do anything better than what they call the diffraction limit. It involves something called an airy shape, which I'm gonna show you on a slide in a little bit. And in a few weeks, we'll actually do a rough calculation of the shape of it. Any questions so far? What happens if you do do something better than the diffraction limit? Uh, like, is there something wrong with your lens? Um, if you manage to, with ordinary glass, do better than the fracture limit, uh, the first place you should go is the patent office. Then you should go to one of the top journals in the field, and then you should go to Stockholm and collect your Nobel Prize. Remember I sent you something, and he said it was better than the fracture limit, and, but it was because my lens was wrong, probably. Um, the spot diagram might look better than the diffraction limit. Oh, okay. okay. So the spot diagram is not doing any wave calculations, all right? The spot diagram, so far you've seen in many files that this little box called show airy disk is checked. The airy disk is the size of the spot that you could focus light to if we had a lens with no aberrations. And if your rays of light are all falling inside the airy disk, that means that the actual lens will not do, will not be better than the diffraction limit, but it will be pretty much at the diffraction limit. Basically, if your rays of light are focused to better than the diffraction limit, that means that aberrations are not limiting you. Diffraction is what will limit you. And sure enough, right now, we see that when we do the diffraction calculation, your energy is focused um, in such a way that the pattern of energy almost exactly matches the black diffraction limit curve. And when we look at this cross section of the PSF, we see this nice diffraction limited ripple that looks just like what we got with the Cartesian oval. So diffraction limited means no aberrations. It means that we, um, that we have a lens for which all paths from the object point to the image point take, if not the same amount of time, at least very close to the same amount of time. And um, we match up with this pattern and your rays are coming in better than the diffraction limit would predict. All that means is the ray calculation. Doesn't mean the actual lens sends rays to a spot smaller than the diffraction limit. It means that a ray calculation would predict that performance. So if you wanna know what's really going on, you better use um, a wave calculation. On the other hand, if you're aberration limited, you can still do a wave calculation. Light is in fact a wave. And when you do that wave calculation, you will get something like, this, so quick focus and see if that helps. 
If you do a wave calculation, you will get something like this, but you really didn't need to run that long calculation. You could have just done this. Notice how the runtime on getting a spot diagram has always been smaller than the runtime on getting this or this. If you're aberration limited, you don't have a good lens, you do have an easy calculation. If you're diffraction limited, you don't have an easy calculation, you do have a good lens. Questions? So what I want you to take away so far is that one hallmark of the diffraction limit is that making your aperture narrower focuses the wave to a wider spot size. One characteristic of the aberration limited lens is that making your aperture narrower focuses the light to a smaller spot size. And so in a few weeks, you're gonna do an assignment that tests this, but basically we could summarize the uh, difference between the diffraction limit and the aberration limit like this. Um, I have a question about the statement you just made. Sure. Um, is that related to uh, Higgins principle, the one Higgins? where it's Higgins, Higgins principle? Yeah. Yeah, where like it's like uh, as the light wave propagates, it's spreads out. Spreads out and like each each part uh, it acts like what a source of light essentially, right? Yes, to do that calculation, that is beyond what we're going to do here. Um, you'd want to take the wave optics class and then read Born and Wolf. It's, it's a principle by which you can visualize these things. It's not always the easiest way to do hand calculations, but that's basically what the computer is doing, is treating each spot on the wave front as its own source of waves. So here I'm plotting spot size versus aperture diameter. Now on this side, we are aberration limited because making your aperture wider is just making your spot size smaller. On this size side, we are diffraction limited because making your aperture wider is making your spot size smaller. And so you really wanna be here because it's going to give you the smallest possible spot size. You don't wanna be here because your spot size would be bigger and you'd be getting less light. You might wanna be here if all you're trying to do is compute the amount, measure the amount of light. You don't really want to do any detailed imaging, but if you wanna do imaging, unless signal to noise is a huge, huge problem for you because your source that you're working with is very dim, you almost certainly wanna be here. Now the human eye, is often limited by signal to noise in both directions. So the human eye does not try to minimize spot size. During the day, the chief concern of the human eye is not overwhelming the retina with too much light. And so your eye becomes very, very narrow and your vision may actually be diffraction limited then. At night, your chief problem is that there's hardly any light. And so your eye opens very wide. And so you might be, you almost certainly be aberration limited. So you could be diffraction limited at high noon. You almost certainly be aberration limited at night. Any questions? Okay, so we've illustrated the phenomena 
in ZMAX. I want to talk a little bit about some history and some classic experiments, and then we'll take a short break and then we'll start doing some calculations. So debates over the nature of light raged for centuries. The Greeks had this idea that the eye might actually emit something. About a thousand years ago, Ibn al-Haytham shot that down. And if you wanna read Ibn al-Haytham, we'll read him next fall. We'll read parts of his work next fall in history of physics. And then when Europeans took up the subject of what is light, there were debates between ray and wave models. Um, Newton, Huygen was a fan of wave models. Newton, everybody says that Newton was a fan of particle models and he was, but his particle models involved um, particles that have oscillating properties. So they weren't the simple particles or rays of geometrical optics. He had done experiments that clearly demonstrated some kind of oscillating and interfering behavior. And so he tried to associate oscillating properties with um, wave, with these particles. It wasn't a completely successful theory, but it's much more nuanced than some of the modern scoffers like to say. There's a certain type of person who hasn't read this work who likes to say, you know, Newton, everyone thinks he was so great, but you should read his optics book. The man set optics back by centuries by saying that light is just a particle. Well, if you read him carefully, he said that it's a particle with oscillating properties. I guess some people like the idea of, ah, that Newton, what did that guy know? And if you wanna read Newton's optics, again, we're gonna read that in fall in history of physics. There were many more experiments after that. It's hard for me to say which one was definitive to people at the time, but I can tell you which one I consider definitive in terms of understanding the phenomena and it's called Poisson spot. The idea is this, um, Poisson spot is a great piece of history because Poisson looked at the theory of Young and Fresnel and said, this theory is ridiculous, okay? This theory, this wave theory of light, of waves spreading out, we know that we know today that waves spread out. Well, actually, here's a good piece of evidence that waves spread out. My microphone, is in the same place as my camera. Now my mouth is turned away from the microphone. And if waves didn't spread out, if waves just went directly forward, the waves would be only going away from my mouth. And you say, hey, well, you know, you're in that weird loft with that tilted ceiling. They could bounce back at the, can at the microphone. Yeah, but they would also spread out. And some of them, frankly, they would ricochet and they would go down to the living room and none of them would make it to the microphone. So the fact that, that you can turn your back to someone and talk and those sound waves will reach behind your head is proof that at least sound waves spread out. And the question was, are, way, are light, is light like a sound wave? Does it spread out? And Hassan said, well, that's ridiculous. If it's spread out, then you could just put some sort of obstacle in front of a light beam. And then if we were to look at, so obstacle detector, here is some light that's coming in and hitting it in the obstacle. Well, this light goes there. This light goes there, this light goes there. So we've got light that's hitting around the obstacle, but then here's the thing, at the edge of the obstacle, it's spreading out, okay? The light at the edge of the obstacle spreads out. And if I just looked at any randomly chosen point, well, the light from one edge and the light from the other edge, these are taking different path lengths. And so if I take two waves that are at different points in their cycle, there's no guarantee that they're gonna add up constructively. But right here, 
in the middle, these two, are the same path length. So that would basically mean that we add up two waves. One of them looks like this, and the other one looks like, I'll shift it up just a little bit. The other one looks like that. We add, constructively, but well, we've got to have a bright spot right here. Poisson said, that is completely absurd. The idea that there's a bright spot in the middle of a shadow. But someone said, you know, it would not be noticeable in the shadow of a large object, but maybe in the shadow of a very tiny object. So then this guy named Arago did the experiment. And then it turned out that in fact, um, someone in Italy had done the experiment like a hundred years earlier, but hadn't recognized it. But in terms of the experiment that actually influenced people that got on the radar and settled the public controversy, I can't say that Arago's experiment was the only thing that impressed them, but I can say that for this phenomenon, Arago's experiment was the one that got on the radar. And for this modern interpreter, the idea of having a bright spot in the middle of a shadow is an incredibly important idea. And so Poisson's spot, it's a theory of Fresnel. Poisson said it's impossible and Arago did the experiment. So naturally Poisson, the guy who you know, went after the idea and dismissed it, got his name on in all the books. Any questions on that? Do you know which Poisson it was? Because I know like the whole family were contributed a lot to mathematics and physics. <laughs> um, good question. I actually have a book on the wave theory of light. So let me check right now. Like was it statistics Poisson? <laughs> um, you know, I don't actually know. It was Simeon Denis Poisson. I don't know French. It was probably Simeon Denis Poisson or something like that. But uh, I used to have, I have Dr. Morales to help me with uh, German names. I used to have a student who was Quebecois to help me with uh, French names. But um, it was, it was Simeon Denis Poisson. Okay, well now I'm curious. I'm curious. So we're going to go to the most in Simeon Denis Poisson. We're going to go to the infallible Wikipedia and we'll trust any assertion for which there's a citation. So he worked on electricity and magnetism. He solved this one. He worked on optics. He worked on statistics. He worked on Poisson brackets in mechanics. Um, looks like it was just one Poisson. Um, the guy did a lot. Other questions? All right, so Poisson spot. Here's the idealized Poisson spot experiment. And if we were doing this on campus right now, I would uh, set it up for you. You have a laser, there's a ball bearing or some other kind of little circular obstruction in the path of the laser beam. And then there's a lens to spread out the beam so you can see a nice big spot on the wall. And the thing on the wall has a uh, dark shadow and then some concentric rings. What really happens is that these outer rings are um, usually hard to, are usually so bright that you have, that this thing in the middle is hard to see, maybe because we uh, tend to do this in classrooms that don't have very good curtains. Um, if we did in a classroom that had really good curtains, 
then this would be easier to see. This is a wonderful photograph here. So ideal, typical. And you see these concentric rings and these concentric rings should look a lot like these concentric rings because they're basically the same phenomenon. Um, I mean, this is not, this is not exactly the same because this is a lens, it's a transparent circular aperture, but a lot of the same um, special functions show up. Now, if we send the light through an open circular aperture, you get something that looks like this or this, which of course looks like that. And here's an illustration of why this fundamentally limits the size of what you can see with visible light. You would love it if the image coming out of the microscope aperture was just a little bright speck of light, but instead you've got these two rings and these um, bright spots with concentric rings about them. And the spots have a finite size, non-zero size. And as you bring the objects closer together, the images start to overlap. And eventually all you could tell by looking at this is that, well, it's a little bit elliptical. There might be two things there, or there might be one thing that's, that isn't symmetric. But you certainly couldn't look at it and say, oh yeah, that's definitely two point sources located exactly this far apart. That you could not do. Even a very good computer could not do that unless we had really, really good signal to noise. This is nice and idealized. This is what usually happens, okay? If you try to measure these things, you see the bright spot, you see the first couple rings. Outside of that, you've just got this crummy signal to noise. If you take a cross-sectional plot of it, eh, you can kind of see a dip there and something of a dip there. And beyond that, God only knows. So that's what usually happens. And this is why imaging is diffraction limited. That's why diffraction is such a big problem for imaging. Any questions? All right, I've been talking for a while. Let's take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, we'll start writing down equations. We will be using Mathematica, but you can close ZMAX.
get started in a minute. Okay, so light waves. I actually want to show one more slide for a moment. I want to show this slide. So light waves, we can characterize light waves either by their wavelength or their period or their frequency. The wavelength being the spacing between the peaks and the frequency being how many cycles per second and the period being the duration of a cycle. Now, the visible light that we have mostly talked about in this class has a wavelength of 500-ish nanometers or half a micron. Um, we work, we see, it's not a coincidence that we see that wavelength or that range. And there are actually two reasons. One, of course, is the sun. Um, obviously, we're gonna, there's a huge evolutionary incentive to be tuned to the uh, wavelength range that gets through the atmosphere. But there's a range of wavelengths that get through the atmosphere. UV gets through the atmosphere. Certain kinds of, uh, some UV gets through the atmosphere. I mean, I know it's saying on here that UV doesn't, but they are oversimplifying. Um, I, got, I got this from some education website that I probably shouldn't have. They're oversimplifying it. We know that some UV gets through the atmosphere because we can get sunburned. Um, and some infrared gets through the atmosphere. The reason why this particular range of wavelengths um, is picked up by the eye is, well, partly because shorter UV tends to be damaging. And so you wouldn't want to build a detector around something that's destroying the detector. And partly because um, a lot of electronic transitions in organic molecules are around there. I mean, there are plenty more in the UV, but again, that would be damaging. There are some in there, there are plenty in the infrared, but this is a particularly rich place and if you were to go out to um, farther in the infrared, then the energy of those transitions would be lower. And so as you go further out, you're approaching the thermal infrared. So this is a nice trade-off. It's far enough from thermal that you don't have to worry about seeing heat instead of seeing an object. It's a uh, short enough wavelength that you can get decent resolution when diffraction limited at high noon. It's a uh, long enough wavelength that you won't get damage. And it's right in a place where you can make, where biology can synthesize organic molecules with transitions. Um, so that's why that was chosen. It has a lot of advantages besides just the fact that it's the solar peak. If you go out to shorter wavelengths, higher energies, you get ultraviolet, of course, then you get x-rays. Now, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, these are really just names. Uh, there's no deeply fundamental difference between visible light, ultraviolet light, gamma rays, or for that matter, radio waves. They're all electromagnetic waves. The biggest difference is what produces them. Gamma rays are pretty much exclusively produced in nuclear reactions. There, there, I'm sure there are ways for people to make gamma rays um, by some other artificial means in a very elaborate way. I say that not because I know of it, but I find that if I say, oh, no one could make that, then I'll hear someone did. But this is the typical natural source of gamma rays, nuclear reactions. X-rays come from deep inside an atom, from um, the inner shell electrons. 
Ultraviolet comes from molecular transitions, from electronic transitions in molecules, as does visible light, as does near infrared light. Further out in the infrared, it tends to come from vibrational transitions in molecules. There's a reason why people often refer to heat as random motion of as thermal energy as random motion and vibration of atoms. Um, strictly speaking, heat could also be electronic transitions. It's just that at room temperature, there aren't a whole lot of tr electronic transitions that can be driven by the heat energy but there are plenty of, of vibrational transitions of a molecule changing from one state of vibration to another state of vibration that could be driven by thermal infrared light. Then you go further out still into the microwave um, and you're going to find that again in some types of vibrational and rotational transitions, um, radio waves, lots of charges, any charge oscillating at what compared to, there are lots of situations where charge will oscillate at frequencies that can produce radio waves. In terms of what they're comparable to in size, well, gamma rays are comparable to the size of a nucleus and X-rays are comparable to the size of an atom. That's why people use X-rays to look at the structure of crystals and molecules because they can uh, see the spacing between atoms. Ultraviolet light is um, going to be larger than the size of most molecules, except for macromolecules. Visible light is comparable to the size of a bacterial cell. It's a little bit smaller than a bacterial cell. A typical bacterial cell is a micron in size. So visible light can discern something about uh, bacteria, not always as much as we would like. Uh, infrared light, depending on what range you're in, could be anything from the size of a large cell to the width of a human hair. Um, microwaves, now we're into centimeters, and so now we're talking millimeters and centimeters, and so now we're talking about very visible objects. Any questions on the nature of these waves? All right, so let's start describing them quantitatively. Got a wave. And in fact, lots of light is not a sinusoidal wave, lots of light is a combination of many different frequencies, um, any broadband light is, but broadband light sources can be broken down into individual sines and cosines, each with their own frequencies. So we're going to treat mostly sinusoidal waves. And of course there are important monochromatic light sources, lasers being the most obvious example and they get used in experiments. So that's another reason to treat them. But the other reason to treat them, the reason why people doing optics would talk about monochromatic waves long before they had lasers is because you can take any real wave and decompose it into that, just like you can take any real substance and decompose it into different elements. Well, this has a wavelength. And if we watch it a little bit later, it looks like that. And if we watch it a little bit later still, I'll do it in a different color just because this is getting crowded. It looks like that. Looks to me like roughly half a cycle has elapsed because the zero now coincides with the peak and the trough now, Cohen's, well, I kind of stretched that out. The point is that as we go eventually through an entire cycle, as we go through an entire cycle of the wave, it will travel one wavelength. So that's lambda over big T, the period. 
or lambda times the frequency is the frequency is one over T. or the number of cycles per second. And we could write a moving wave of this form. This is not the way we'll ultimately write it, but we're starting at the beginning here. Okay, first of all, we normally describe electromagnetic waves by their electric fields. Of course, they also have magnetic fields, but the magnetic forces turn out to be weak because it turns out that if you were to take a snapshot of one of these waves, have an E field, it looks like that. I'm trying to draw this nicely. We have an E field that looks like this. This is the direction that the wave is traveling. And the E field is perpendicular to the direction. If the field is going into the screen, the e, if it's traveling, if the wave is traveling into the screen, the field could be going vertically or horizontally or diagonally or whatever. And there's a B field that is perpendicular to both of those. I'm trying to draw it coming in and out of the page. Draw it like that. Well, it turns out that we could write that B field as B naught cosine of two pi times X over lambda minus V over T. And this thing would also oscillate at the same frequency, would have the same wavelength. And it would be in phase, meaning it would be in sync. Whenever E is at its peak, B is at its peak. Whenever E is zero, B is zero. Whenever E has flipped directions, B has flipped directions. And the length of that B vector, this B naught is the vector amplitude. And you're thinking, what's a vector amplitude? I mean, you know what an amplitude is. It's if we're just looking at something wiggling up and down, the amplitude is how far up or how far down it goes. Well, vector amplitude is just telling you, okay, when this electric field is at its strongest, is it pointing in the X direction? Is it pointing in the Y direction, the Z direction? What direction is it pointing in? All right, so E naught, if you were to write it down to describe some real data, it might be something like, I don't know, three volts per meter times X hat. That would be perfectly reasonable value of E naught, you know, or it might be 0 0.11 volts per meter times X hat minus Y hat plus three Z hat over to normalize the square root of 11. Could be whatever, you know, these would all be perfectly reasonable things. It's gonna be some number telling you what's the maximum field strength times some unit vector telling you what direction it pushes in. Then the magnitude of B naught, the magnitude of B will be similar. Well, it turns out that the magnitude of B is one over the speed of light divided by the magnitude of E. That's if you work in SI units. If you work in God's own units, then they're, they have the same magnitude. God's own units being heavy side Lorentz. But in SI units, this is their, how their magnitudes are related. Well, how, what's the charge? Uh, what's the force on a charge in an electric field? QE. 
And what's the charge? What's the force on a charge in a magnetic field? QV cross V. Yep. So the maximum possible electric force be Q E naught. And the maximum possible magnetic force, assuming that everything works out right so that that vector cross product is simple, would be Q V B naught or Q V E naught over C. Hey, this thing shows up here. And here, it's just, it's got an extra V over C. And not only is V over C less than one, has to be less than one, but V over C is actually less than 0.01 for most of the situations that we're interested in in optics most of the time. So magnetic forces on electrons in most of the materials that we would ever think about are much smaller. And so people usually ignore magnetic forces. Now there are exceptions, magneto-optical effects are very real, they're very interesting, but they're not the default. Okay. So we could write it out like this, but now I'm going to show you over the next 10 minutes, some increasing levels of abstraction. And the whole reason why we're going to these increasing levels of abstraction is because what we ultimately want to do is add up many different waves. And in order to add up many different waves, we have to work in a notation that doesn't look as intuitive, but makes the algebra so much simpler. So again, I'll just restate what we have. I'm going to do two pi x over lambda. And I said that lambda over T equals V, or I should really say C for this case, because lambda over T equals V is a general statement about any wave going at a speed V, but we're talking about light waves here. So for light waves, we call it C. So T is C over lambda. And one over T is equal to lambda over C. I feel like, no, I did that wrong. Right. T one over T is C over lambda. So I can write that as C T over lambda. Or I could write that as E naught cosine two pi over lambda X minus C T. Now people don't want to write out any more symbols than they have to. So they call this K. So I could rewrite this as E naught cosine of KX minus two pi C over lambda T. Well, C over lambda is one over the period or the frequency. So two pi C over lambda is two pi F. Now nobody wants to keep writing out two pi F. The more two pi's you write out, the more chances you give yourself to make a mistake when doing algebra. And I swear that's what, for very good reason, that's what half of physics notation is about. Half of the choices made in physics notation were basically to give people fewer chances to make algebra mistakes. It's a bit like the reason why doctors use such elaborate notation. It's to give themselves less chance to make a mistake because they could just say, okay, that guy has an injury to the shoulder blade. 
but they're never going to say that. I mean, the shoulder blade, well, there's lots of different pieces to it. They're going to say they have a laceration that pierced the such and such mu muscle in the frontal yada yada of the show of whatever the Latin term for it is. They have like a hundred different words for all of the many different parts of that, not because they're trying to confuse you, but they're trying to give themselves fewer chances to screw up. Because if they just said, oh, you know, it's like somewhere up in like the shoulder, then somebody could do the wrong procedure on you. So they use this very precise terminology to give themselves fewer chances to screw up. Well, this is why we use more abstract notation to give ourselves fewer chances to screw up, even if it means that an outsider doesn't understand it as easily. So they call two pi f omega. So I can rewrite this as e naught cosine kx minus omega t. And k is called the wave number. And then omega, I just finished saying, oh, we're giving ourselves fewer chances to screw up. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to naming, we do have more chances to screw up. Um, this is sometimes called the frequency to which you could say, but what about one over T? Isn't that also a frequency? So then they say, okay, fine. Well, this is the angular frequency. And you say angular frequency, what's the angle in there? And they say, well, you know, it's in radians. And you say, what on earth are you talking about radians? They say, look, we're taking the cosine of something, okay? The input to the cosine is implicitly in radians. And so when we multiply omega times T, we get some number of radians for the cosine. So we can plug that, we can, some number of radians, we can plug it into a cosine. Whereas F times T is T over the period or the number of cycles. And this becomes important when we do things with thin film problems, because some people will say, if something went through a full cycle of oscillation, it was one cycle. And if it went through a half cycle of oscillation, one half. And you say, well, what else could it be? Somebody else might say full cycle is two pi because it would be two pi radians. And the half cycle would be pi radians. And people will use both. And people who do nuclear magnetic resonance will talk about things called pi pulses designed to take something, to take a spin through a half rotation or go halfway around. And so they'll talk about pi pulses when they mean a half a cycle. But it's called an angular frequency because we're taking a cosine and it needs to be in radians. Any questions so far? Well, now here's the problem. Somebody comes along and says, all right, well, I wanna add two waves. And so far, all I've done is rewrite this thing up here with fewer symbols. That meant I have to remember what omega and k are. Now someone says, well, I've got this wave and I've got this other wave. And I wanna know what happens when I add them. I want a formula for adding them. So we've got E1 cosine of Kx minus omega t plus V. This is a phase shift. All that means is that if we're at x equals zero and t equals zero, we're not taking, we're at x equals zero and t equals zero. You might say, oh, well, that's zero, yeah. That's zero, yeah. But this is non-zero. So we're not taking the cosine of zero. We're taking the cosine of something else. That's just another way of saying that this wave is not at its peak when x and t are zero. And that's, that's allowed. There are waves that are at their peaks at all sorts of places and times. It doesn't have to be zero. Plus E2 cosine of just Kx minus omega t. 
And somebody says, can you add those? And yeah, we could go dig out our trig identities. We could use the fact that cosine of theta one minus theta two is equal to, um, wait, I think that's the cosine of the sum. That's cosine of theta one, cosine of theta two minus sine theta one, sine theta two. Um, so we could then say, okay, well, we, we can do that um, because you know this would be theta one and this would be theta one and this would be theta two. I don't really want to do that. And not just because there's three minutes left. So let's use the fact that e to the i times kx minus omega t is equal to cosine of kx minus omega t plus i sine of kx minus omega t. And if we use that fact, then the real part of that, e to the i kx minus omega t, is just this. Okay, well, what does that buy us? Um, all we've done is restate it. Here's what it buys us. It buys us the fact that we, when we add these two cosines, we're taking the real part of E1, E to the I, Kx minus omega T. Oops, I forgot the plus phi, plus E2, E to the I, Kx minus omega T. And you see how these two terms are so similar now? The nice thing is that we can factor exponentials very easily. So we get E1, E to the I phi, E to the I kx minus omega t, plus E2, e to the i kx minus omega t. Or this whole thing that's been repeated, e1 e to the i phi plus e2. And you see how we've just simplified adding those two waves? That's why we write waves this way. We write, everybody in optics writes waves this way to the point where in most optics journals, in textbooks, they're still getting used to things. They'll write out the real part. They'll write out the explicitly that we're taking the real part. In optics journals, they just tend to plunge right in with the complex waves. And it's just understood that you're taking the real part. I like making language analogies all the time. So I'll say that this is a lot like languages where sometimes you leave off the subject of a verb and it's just understood what the subject must be. In Spanish, you don't have to say, um, yo tengo un, un libro en mi mano, right? I have a book in my hand. You can just say, tengo un libro en mi mano. You can leave off the yo, the I. Yo is I, it's the subject of the verb. Tengo is have, it's the verb but it's understood that tango always has yo as its subject. Likewise, whenever you see in an optics journal, e to the, or any subject of physics that uses waves, this thing, it's just understood that at the end you will be taking the real part. Any questions? Okay, so on Thursday, there's an assignment due where you practice with some of these expressions for waves. And uh, then we will work on interpreting those expressions. And um, the ZMAX assignment is also due. You should also start on next week's ZMAX assignment. I'll be available in my usual office hours. Have a good day. <laughs>
Justin, you have a question? 